Here we are. Ready? Okay, here it is. An Uber passenger... An Uber passenger taps the driver upon the shoulder to ask him a question. The driver screamed, ah, and lost control of his car, nearly hitting a bus. And he went upon the footpath, and he stopped inches from the shop window. For a second, everything went quiet in the car. Then the driver said, look, man, don't ever do that again. You scared the daylights out of me. The passenger apologized and said, I mean, I didn't realize that a little tap on your shoulder would scare you so much. The driver replied, sorry, it's really not your fault. Today is my first day as an Uber driver. I've been driving a hearse for the last 25 years. So the, so the hearse carries dead people. He was driving dead people for the last 25 years. So, so dead people tapping on the shoulder, Jesus must be in the house because he always messed up funerals. So anyway. Okay. Rehearsed. <laughs> okay, good. Yes, I'm alive. I'm alive because Christ is on the inside. So we're, we're going to continue what we started a couple weeks ago. Last week, we kind of got ambushed by the goodness of God, so we just kind of followed him. And see, that's part of the journey that as we, as we confess Jesus and, and we literally begin to lay our lives down for him, he begins to lead us. And so last week, we just kind of followed what Holy Spirit wanted to do, and it, it just turned into this intimate time where God just unlocked his heart to us, and we just continued to worship and just allow just what, what he was doing to happen in the room. So, um, yeah, and, and we're always open for that, and I, that's, just, that's just the way we like to roll with the king, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, so, but let's go ahead and let's go to uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 14, and what we're going to be doing over the next several weeks is, is we're talking about the prophetic. We're talking about uh, just the gifts of Holy Spirit, but in particular, we're going to talk about just the prophetic words of knowledge, words of wisdom, because I believe God, what God wants to establish really is a people that really understand his heart and then actually speak from the revelation of knowing his heart to a lost people that are around us day in and day out. And so we're going to start here in 1 Corinthians chapter 14. And, you know, we talked a little bit about uh, chapter 12, and we will go back into some of that today. But I, I just, to me, this is the foundation for everything that we're doing, okay? This is the reason Jesus came. It's all about love. It really was the whole reason he was came. That was his whole motivation. It came from that place of love. First of all, just, he just wanted us sincerely, deeply. You know, and we, we know the story that it, even as Adam and Eve had, had chosen to, to kind of go their own way and not trust the goodness of the Father, you know, it was, it was purpose in the heart of the Father that, that he was going to prepare a way, and that, that comes through his son, Jesus. So let's go ahead and just, I'm going to read from the New King James, and then I'm actually going to probably read from a couple other versions as well. So 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 1, it says, Pursue love and eagerly desire spiritual gifts, especially that you may prophesy. And so this idea of the pursuing love, that, that in, in, in 1 Corinthians, Paul is, is writing to a church that, that is very in tune to the realm of the Spirit. And, and they're maturing in their gifts. And part of even what chapter 12 addresses is, is, I don't want you to be ignorant of the spiritual. And so part of it, he's, he's teaching them and he's instructing them. And again, this is a letter that he, he wrote to them. I believe that he also taught these very same things in person. But he's reminding and reiterating the reality that it all needs to come from this place of love because... In chapter 13 of 1 Corinthians, that whole chapter is what love looks like. And in chapter 13, he, he, he exposes this reality of how amazing God's love is and that, that we are to be ones, because we have been created in his image, that we get to emanate, we get to reflect, we get to actually be the very hands and feet and the heartbeat of the Father that brings love. And so, he, pursue love and eagerly desire spiritual gifts. 
especially that you may prophesy. I, I want to read for actually from the, from the message translation, if you just follow me here and just listen. It says this, go after a life of love. Go after a life of love as if your life depends on it. I mean, think about that. that. Go after a life of love as if your life depends on it. And then he goes on with this, because it does. I mean, that's the true statement. See, that's the true representation of this amazing God who is uncreated, who has always been and will always be. And the fact that you and I were created in his image to be like him. And so this idea again, go after a life of love as if your life depends upon it because it does. I'm, I'm going to read from, the, from the, uh, the amplified version here as well. And here's what it says. It says, pursue this love. And again, it's referring to the love that, that never fails, that never fades, is always available. It says, pursue this love with eagerness. Make it your goal. And that really is our heart's desire. And that, that's part of what the Lord has just been, been taking me in these places where, where it, it needs to be about love. It's not about what I say. It's really about what's inside my heart. Because Jesus said that from the abundance of your heart, you'll actually speak. And so as, as, as we begin to understand, and see, to me, this is the beauty of the whole journey as a Christian, is that. It really is a process. It really is a journey that, that each day we can wake up and say, God, I want to know more of your love. And he'll show it to us. He'll give it to us. He doesn't just show. He gives it to us. He deposits that reality of really what's on the inside of each one of us. Because every one of us, regardless if we know Jesus or not, actually has been created for his good pleasure. Every human being on planet Earth was created by God for God so that we can represent him well. And to me, that, that just, it's amazing to me how, how amazing his love is. So again, pursue this love with eagerness and make it your goal, yet earnestly desire and cultivate the spiritual gifts to be used by believers for the benefit of the church, but especially that you may prophesy to foretell the future and to speak this new message from God to the people. And this idea that that's what we want to begin to unlock, and I want you to begin to discover, one, what is the hope that's inside of you? Two, what is the goal that God wants to bring out of you, even in this, this time in this season? And secondly, that you begin to really see the deposits of God's reflection, the deposits of God's DNA in the very inside of you, that, that with, with, with one touch of his love, all of a sudden you become his representation on the earth. And so... This idea of, of the prophetic, because he, I, I love how, how Paul puts this, is that it, it's about foretelling things to come, but the reality, it's about building up too. Because if we go down to actually verse, uh, verse 3 in the same chapter, let's go down there real quick. And it says, but he who prophesies speaks edification, exhortation, and comfort to men. And this idea that, that the word edification means to build up. It means to build, like a building. A building is, is an edifice. It's, it's a building. And see, that's what our words do, that when we prophesy, the goal is to build someone up, not tear them down. That really isn't our job at all. Actually, our job is to build up and call forth the gold, call forth the reality, call forth the goodness of God that's in the inside, and to build an individual up. That is the goal and focus. It goes back to that whole goal of love. That when we make love the goal, guess what? We begin to build people up in the most holy vein. And this idea of, of exhortation, and exhortation means to, to draw near, to call someone near to God. And see, that's the beauty of it. See, there, there's a lot of noise out there. You know, the enemy's always speaking, and he's, his, his, his voice can sometimes sound like God. But we just need to test that. Even, even, even John says in, in 1 John that we should actually test the spirits to, to find out where it's coming from. And, and we're going to talk about hearing the voice of God and just the different ways that he speaks. But there's, there's a testing of the voice. And see, if a voice brings condemnation or destruction or a tearing down in a way that, that makes you feel like crap, yeah, that's pretty much the devil. I mean, our father's good. And his, his whole desire is as, as we do because it's motivated out of a place of love to see someone built up and strengthened and encouraged. 
And so this idea that, that as, as we build up, then we also, we, we want to draw people near, not to ourselves. We want to draw them near to this king that sits on a throne, that smiles, that's full of joy, that his goodness and his grace is represented because it says that the goodness, actually in, in Romans chapter 2 verse 4, it says that, that the goodness or the kindness of God is what leads an individual to repentance or that place of turning and returning actually to original intent to be the glory of God in the earth. I mean, that's amazing. And so this idea that, again, and then the last thing, of course, comfort. I mean, that is, that's part of Holy Spirit's name. He is the comfort. That's why Jesus, he said, you know, it's better that I go because when I do, the Father's going to send another, and he's going to comfort you, and he's going to be there for you. He's going to speak to you. He's going to draw you in to the goodness and grace of your destiny. He's going to convict of sin. See, it's the Holy Spirit's job to convict of sin. It's not our job. Our job is to love and love well. And see, again, it, it, it's a process. It's a discovery that as we, we begin to see actually the truth of, of our own destiny and our own true identity in Christ, then we begin to see the same things in the people that pass us by every day, whether they know Jesus or not. We begin to actually see from the vantage point of the Father. We begin to see how the Father sees, how the Father perceives See, because God doesn't make junk. God doesn't make mistakes. And there's not a single person here that's a mistake. You were in the heart of God before time ever was. Now, here the reality is, you know what? I mean, I, I've got a son that, that was born out of wedlock. The mistake was mine and his mom's. and Not Renee's, but I, I have a girlfriend in college, actually. The mistake was ours. He was never a mistake. He's not illegitimate. He was always in the heart of God. And can I just say that over everyone in this room, you are all in the heart of God. There's not a single illegitimate person in this room. You were created for greatness. You were created for destiny. And I just want you to receive these words. I want your heart to be unlocked so that you can see really just the nature and character of God. Because when we begin to see how he sees, and then, then God begins to, to awaken those gifts that are inside of us. Because it says that we are to eagerly desire them. And, and God wants to create an eagerness uh, of, of the spiritual gifts. And in, in, in chapter 12, it talks about the different gifts of the Holy Spirit. And, and this idea that Paul, when he was addressing the Corinthians, says, he goes, guys, I don't want you to be ignorant about the spiritual things. But there's, there's this, there's, there, all of these gifts that are given is, is, is for the betterment of the, of the body of Christ. And it really is, again, it's about building each other up. It's about drawing family near. It's about bringing unity. It's about bringing strength. It's about coming alongside one another to truly be an individual that helps and holds arms up. Just like Aaron and her stood alongside Moses in the midst of the battle. We have that same reality that we're called to do for each one of us in the body of Christ. And we need one another. We really do. We need one another. In our uniqueness, we need one another. It's diversity in unity, actually, is university. Actually, that's where the word comes from. And it's the diversity of gifts that each one of us has. But there's a, there's a reality. There's, there's these gifts that God wants to give to us. And, and it's the gifts of the word of wisdom. We talked about that. And, and there's the, the gifts of, of the word of knowledge. And there's, there's the discerning of spirits. There's the, the, the gift of faith. There's the, the gift of, of, of miracles. There's the gifts of healing. There's the gift of prophecy. There's the gift of tongues. There's the gift of interpretation of tongues. And see, these gifts, when used, because the Holy Spirit's the one that gives them, that's, see, that's the beauty of it. They're gifts that God gives. And we just need to receive them. And it goes back to this here in, in verse 3. It's about the edification to build up. It's about the exhortation to draw near. And it's about bringing comfort to the hearts of men. See, that, that, that if we just begin to, to make that the goal, and that really becomes the goal of, of when we prophesy and when we begin to, to release the heart of God, our, 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 our job becomes really easy. Because it doesn't come with condemnation. Because it says that, therefore, there is no condemnation for those that are in Christ Jesus. And if, it, if there's a condemning word that's coming, it's probably not the Father that's speaking. And so I, I, let's, let's just real quick scroll down to, because uh, Paul just continues to go on and address this whole idea of just the prophetic. But let's go down to verse 24 and 25. And it says here, But all prophecy 
If an unbeliever or an uninformed person comes in, he will be convinced by all, and he is convicted by all. And thus the secrets of his hearts are revealed, so that falling down on his face, he will worship God and report that God is truly among you. And so I've heard this this message preached in a way where our job is to convict people of sin. That's not true. That's not what actually is being convicted here. See, the reality says that actually in Romans that all of us have fallen short of the glory of God. That when we prophesy, guess what? We begin to reveal what's inside every individual. We begin to reveal the reality that, that, that they have fallen short of the glory of God and, and it's actually available to them. See, our God, our, our God has, has good things for every person. And I believe that, you know, I could prophesy over every single one of you, God has got something good to say to every one of you. And one, more than anything, he just loves you. He loves you with an unfailing, everlasting love. He will never leave you. He will never forsake you. But this idea that that, that, that our job, that even as we prophesy, that it says that even if an unbeliever comes in and they hear us prophesying and they hear us speaking of the wonders and the awe and the goodness of God, it says that an individual's own heart would be convicted that they've been created for more. It begins to reveal the very thing that God has inside of them. It says that actually it will reveal the very secrets of their heart. I mean, think about that. Revealing the secrets. And see, that's what God wants to do is he wants to reveal secrets. Not secrets that, not secret sin, secret shame. That's actually not at all the revealing it's talking about here. It's actually the secret of actually why God had created an individual. I mean, our whole job in the prophetic is we want, we want to call forth the gold. We want to unearth the reality of God's kindness and goodness in the hearts of men and women. And as we do that, it begins to unlock just the destiny that God had purpose for them. And as we begin to speak, we begin to actually cause a revealing of the secrets of why one, an individual was created. Because in that place, we begin to unearth and we begin to show that, that hidden secret is like the purpose, their true identity. Their true destiny. We begin to unearth those things. You know, it's not about calling out the dirt because I tell you what, a sinner knows they're a sinner. It's true. Again, it, Holy Spirit does a really good job, so let's just not be Him. I mean, really, really, our job is to edify and exhort and just bring comfort to individuals. And when we do that, I mean, that's what all of a sudden that the secrets that that, that God has inside of them is revealed. I mean, think about you know a gold miner. And a gold miner goes down, and, and they're digging, and they're digging all this dirt. They're not looking for dirt. They're getting the dirt out of the way to get to the gold. You know, and many times we need to do the same thing as, as friends of God and as sons and daughters of God, that it's not about the dirt that we see even in an individual and the sin that someone's actually in, but it's about getting to the gold that causes them to rise up and be all God's called them to be. And see, that's the whole goal of the prophetic. It really is about pursuing. It really is about making love the goal. And when we do, guess what? People rise up from the ashes. The shame is removed. The barriers, the hindrances, and all of a sudden they begin to see how amazing God is. Because it says here that it wasn't the shame and guilt. See, if, if we were to share, share the, those kinds of things, why would someone fall down and worship? I'm just saying. Because, see, that was the result that as the secret was revealed about how amazing an individual is, all of a sudden they're like, oh, my gosh, he's real. See, the fruit of it is is, is worship. The fruit of it is, is that revealing that God is real. And the thing about it is he's not distant. He's not far off. He's actually really close. Even right now, he's really close. He's, he's actually speaking to hearts right now. He's awakening people right now to the truth of how amazing his love and his grace is, and that it, it is, is so available. And so, again, our, our whole role is to, to find the treasures in the hearts of sinners so that they experience the kindness of God. And when they experience the kindness of God, guess what? It causes an individual to do an about face, to turn from the ways, because, see, that's part of what the prophetic does, is it begins to open pathways, and it's, and it's many times an invitation into the deeper things of someone's inheritance to someone's destiny. 
And many times that is the case of the prophetic, is that it's, it's an invitation to know God, to be in his presence, to draw near, to see what, what he's got in store for every individual. And so what happens when, it, when an individual repents? And again, again, God is bringing such a beauty to that word back to the body of Christ because that word actually is, is pulled from the, the Greek word uh, metanoia, which is where we get the word metamorphosis. It's about changing. It's about shifting. And, and more than anything is God wants our thoughts and our mindsets to be changed, first and foremost, how good he is. That's the biggest change. That's the biggest part of repentance is that all of a sudden we go, like it says here actually in, in verse 25, so that they would fall down upon their face and report, God truly is among you. It's about the worship. And see, that's what happens when all of a sudden the heart is turned and the mind gets renewed with the truth of who we're called to be as sons and daughters of the Most High God. All of a sudden there's this, there's this, there's this metamorphosis, this tran transformation that begins to happen as we begin to align ourselves with truth. Because I tell you what, there, there, are, there are voices bombarding us every moment of every day. Who are we tuned into? And we're tuned into channel 360, and we should be channeled into channel 365 because God's speaking every day. And his voice is so good, really. Every person on planet Earth can hear God's voice. And, and we're going to go into just the, the multifaceted ways that God speaks next week and just kind of unlock that a little bit more. But, but, but God's speaking right now even to some of you. And he, he wants you to have a, a right understanding of how good he is and that he has amazing plans for you. And see, that's the part of repentance, that as we allow our mindset to be shifted and we allow it to line up with the spirit man that's inside of us, that all of a sudden our, our thoughts come into alignment with God. And we actually see God for how good he is because he is good. He is good. He is love. It's not just something he does. He is love. It's the very fabric of his being. And the fact that we have all been created in his image, that's why Paul can boldly say, pursue love. Go after it. Go after a life of love as if your life depends on it. Because it does. It does. It, we, we depend on love. And see, because love, that's what sets us apart from every other religion on the planet. We will know you are Christian by love, by love. You know what I mean? And that's, that's, that is true. You know, and too often, we, we, can, we, can, we, we make mistakes and get over it. Because you know what? We're not perfect yet, but we're being perfected in Christ. And see, that's to me, that's the quick thing, is that when all of a sudden we realize that maybe we uh, misrepresented Jesus in a way that just wasn't quite true, just repent. Get your heart lined up. Get your mind lined up, actually, with the truth of how amazing God is. And see, there's another part to that, too, that as, as our mindset is shifted towards how amazing God is, there's also a dimension, too, that we need to shift our mindset of how amazing you are. You are created in the image of the uncreated God. I mean, just, just, just think about that for a minute. You have been created in the image of the uncreated God. Again, he doesn't make mistakes. He's created you to be a representer of his love. And see, when we allow just all of that mindset to begin to shift... And then we begin to step into the truth of our true identity that, that it, like Peter was talking about in 1 Peter 2, verse 9. He says that, that we are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood. And we begin to walk out that dimension of royalty, that the king of kings, we're actually, we're not outcasts. We're actually related. We're actually co-laboring with him. We're actually called to be within the mix of what he's doing. And he's actually inviting each one of us into the deeper place with him. That in that place of, of just allowing our very being to be lined up with him. And this idea of the, of the royal priesthood talks about who really are the true of our destiny. 
that we're seated with Christ in these heavenly places. There's a throne created for you. There's mansions created for you. And as we just allow that truth to, to permeate the reality. And see, the whole idea of, of a priesthood, priesthood isn't necessarily a guy that wears a collar, okay? It really has nothing to do with that. Or a guy that wears a really groovy hat. I mean, you can wear a groovy hat. That's all. I'm not saying anything wrong with that. But what I'm saying, the priesthood really is about, it's an individual that is allowed to go before his presence. See, because when, when Jesus, that day on Calvary, when he was completely displayed, broken and blood being poured out from, I mean, everywhere. His blood was being shed. That in that day, it says that when he breathed his last breath, he said, it's finished. And it says then that there, in, in the temple, the veil was torn in two, and it gave us all access. That there was no longer just one special individual that could go before his presence, but literally Jesus prepared a way so all of us could boldly come before the throne of grace. And see, me, that's just the beauty of, of a life uh, as a Christian. That is the beauty of a life of a believer in Jesus Christ, is that we've got all access to God, and, and he will not pff, smack us when we're down. Can I just say that? He really won't. You know, and, and too often, you know, there's, that's the portrayal of God. Is that, oh, that was, you know, God's just trying to teach you something. Yeah, he gave me that cancer because he needed to teach you a lesson. Yeah, you're blind because, well, God needs to teach you a lesson. That's just ridiculous. Come, come here, Elizabeth. So it'd be like if, if I took my daughter, Elizabeth, and, and, and Elizabeth, I need to teach you something. Man, I'm not done yet. I'm going to break your arm till they poke your eyes out. Yeah, now she'll learn. Now she'll learn. But you'll figure it out, too, what you're supposed to learn and all of this. That'd be, see, I'd be thrown in jail for child abuse. No, actually, it's like this. Come here. I, I've got some amazing things for you. I got, I, I just, yeah, just stay by my side. And when you fall down, you could fall down again. I'll be there to pick you back up and restore you back into wholeness. See, that's the heart of the Father. See, the Father doesn't release bad things on good people or any person to teach them a lesson. That's the devil. Full-on Satan. That's where that crap comes from. I, I said that word crap again. I just said it again, didn't I? Anyway, the point is, the point is God's good. And he's for us. And if God's for us, who can be against us? And that doesn't mean we're, there isn't warfare in the midst of our day because there is real warfare. We are in a real battle, for real. There's a devil that hates you with a passion. That is his passion. He hates you. He hates God and he hates you. But there's a God who's got an incredible passion, and it's you. He loves 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 you. And his heart is to see you soar and to be all you can be. And see, that's my, that's my heart for my daughter. I want to see Elizabeth soar in the dreams that God has put in her heart. And see, that's what a good father does. Is they want to see their children succeed. They want to see uh, everyone succeed. I mean, I'm just being honest with you. God wants to see you succeed. He's got an amazing plan for you. And it's not over yet. You may have gone through the valley of the shadow of death, but you're going through it and you're coming to the other side because when you get to the other side, there's green pastures and there's a table, a banqueting table that has been set for you that is so full of life, so full of goodness, so full of bounty, so full of just anything you can imagine. See, that's what God has got set for you as you cross to the other side. And here's the deal. is he, he will lead you through. He will bring you to the other side. He won't leave you hanging. You know, friends can fail us. Parents can fail us. But God will never fail us. I'm not a perfect dad. I've fallen short of his glory several times. But it's in that place of humility or I just ask for forgiveness. You see, that's the beauty of, of, a, of a journey with, the, with this amazing God and this King. Is that he wants to hold you close. See, that was one thing that David really understood in Psalm 23. It says that, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, you are with me. 
there's a poem, and some of you may have heard it, but it was about footprints in the sand. And this idea that we go through different times and different seasons. And there was times and seasons when it seemed like it was the most difficult. There was only one set of footprints. And we sometimes see, as we look back, as the one set of footprints as our own. And the fact that God somehow left us. And at the end of the story, it basically goes, in those times when it appeared as if it was only one footprint, they were mine because I picked you up and carried you. And see, that's what God does is he will pick us up and he will carry us in his arms of love. That's why he allowed himself to be so vulnerable that day on the cross of Calvary. He won't beat you when you're down. He will let you be there to pick you up. He'll, he'll brush your knees off. Oh, we need some new jeans here or something. <laughs> holy but, well, they're holy jeans, of course. That's why she wore them on Sunday. <laughs> Better get you some new jeans there, honey. Anyway. But see, to me, that is just such a, a perfect example of really God's heart towards us. And see, that is the whole goal of the prophetic as we begin to move into this, this reality that we want to draw the gold because, again, like I said, a, a gold miner will go down and they'll, they'll be digging, and they're digging dirt. They're digging the dirt. They're, they're getting the dirt out of the way so they can find the gold. And we get to do the same thing. we got to get past the dirt. Because when we do, we begin to see the awesomeness, the most amazing treasure in the world, and it's you. It says that, you know, even Jesus in his parable, he said that a man went into a field, and he found this treasure, and he went, dang, went and sold all he had, came back and bought the field. It wasn't about the field. It was about what was in the field. It was the treasure. And the fact that that's what he did that day when he died for us on the cross of Calvary is that he, he bought us with his own very life. I mean, it's such an amazing demonstration of love. And it goes back to that. It really goes back to that. It has to be about love. You know, in Jeremiah 29, verse 11, it says that, I know the plans that I have for you, says the Lord. Plans to prosper you, not harm you. Plans for a, for a hope and a future. And see, that's what God has for every one of us. He, he's got an amazing plan, not to harm you, not to harm you, not to harm you. But there, there are amazing plans that will prosper you, that will propel you into what you're called to be as a son and as a daughter. And you know what? Your calling may be so different than mine, many of you. In fact, almost all of you. And see, that's beautiful. See, don't try to be me. Be you. In fact, you have permission to be you because, you know, the, the world bombards us with all kinds of things saying we're not good enough and, 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 and all of this, this contrary reality where God's saying, no, 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 that's not who I called you to be. And we compare ourselves with one another. But the truth is that when we encounter his love and we're perfected by his love and we allow his love to literally saturate our very being, our body, our soul, our spirit, and we're awakened to the truth of our true identity, the comparison thing goes away. Because we're secure in him. We're secure in love. And again, that's, that's what the prophetic does. The prophetic will literally do that. It will begin to draw the goodness out of people. It will begin to, to build an individual up. And see, where I get excited is because what we're beginning to see is, 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 a, is a trickling of a, of a fresh outpouring of God's love and his presence. You know, when we look in Acts chapter 2, 17 through 21, in fact, let's just go there. Let's just read it because it's so good because God is so good. Acts chapter 2. Verse 17 there. But it says then, but, but Peter, standing up with the eleven, raised his voice and said to them, Men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and heed my words. 
But these men are not drunk, as you suppose, since it is only nine o'clock in the morning. But this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. And it shall come to pass in the last days, says God, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall see visions. Your old men shall dream dreams. And upon my men servant and maid servants, I will pour out my spirit in those days. And they shall prophesy. And I will show wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth beneath, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. And the sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon shall be turned into blood before the the coming of the great and awesome day of the Lord. And it shall come to pass that whenever who calls upon the name of the Lord, they shall be saved. That's a pretty powerful chunk of scripture there. And see, in, the, in this reality, it was, it was spoken by the prophet Joel. It was foretold by the prophet Joel that there is a day coming, and it's the last days. It wasn't, the, it's not, and, and I, that's really the key, actually. Here's the, in the last days, and see, the last days actually started on the day of Pentecost. It means there's more than one. It's not, it's not the last day. The last day will be the day of judgment when all of us will stand before that, that judgment seat and, and we'll, we'll have to give account for the reality of what we've done with the precious love of Jesus. But in the last days is, is, a, is a whole prophetic dimension that is unlocked and released and sons and daughters will prophesy. See, that's what I love about it. It's, it's men and women will prophesy. It won't be just men. It's going to be men and women. And see, the amazing thing that is with it, it's, it's young will have visions. Old people will have dreams. So I guess I'm old now because I dream. Um, but the idea, again, it's, it's no respect of even, even someone's age. He's going he's gonna to pour it upon the young. He's going to pour it upon the old. And this idea that even where it talks about men servants and maid servants, the idea that, that even ones that would be considered kind of... Um, even if social economic class, like even those that people like in, in like in India, in India they have what is called as the is the Dalits, which they're considered actually outcasts. They they literally are looked at less than not just human beings, but even less than cows, less than flies, less than. And see, God's going to pour out His Spirit on all. Every person is going to receive His power and His presence. See, God is no respecter in what he's about to do. And to me, that's the beauty of what God is about to do. is because he wants you to prophesy. He wants you to prophesy. He wants you to prophesy. Because when we begin to prophesy and we begin to cultivate a prophetic community and a prophetic culture, all of a sudden, we're all beginning to prophesy. And we're prophesying over one. And we're being built up. We're being strengthened. We're being encouraged. We're being comforted to go take the world. That's the hidden plan, you know. It's about dominion. It's about dominion. Anyway. Establishing the king's domain. Because there's a king that the earth is his and everything that's in it. It's already his. We're literally enforcing the reality and the victory of Calvary. And he's given us keys to do so. That we can open doors that no one can shut. And we can shut doors that no one can open because God is on our side. And so just use your keys because they're the keys to the kingdom. And it really is about being a prophetic company of people that, that when we just begin to pursue this dimension of love and we begin to see through the eyes of Christ and through the eyes of the Father. And we want to see the next generation lifted up to go way beyond wherever I could go. See, that's my, that's one of my soul desires. That's why we're down here. And I look around and I go, oh, but it's coming. The waves of revival are coming. The spigot's been opened. And there's an outpouring that's coming. And see, 
Nothing's going to hold back from God pouring out his presence and his spirit. And I'll tell you what, the University of Wisconsin-Madison is about to come into its destiny. The University of Wisconsin-Madison is about to come into a rude awakening that God is causing an awakening. He's causing an awakening. I decree and declare God is causing an awakening. It's going to be a rude awakening because he's going to come against everything that intellectual and humanism has to say. It's all about love. It's all about love. And love will offend. It will offend a religious spirit. Those are the ones Jesus offended. He offended the religious. It wasn't the sinner that he offended. In fact, the sinner he always restored and called them into greatness. And yet he gave simple instructions. Oh, and by the way, Go sin no more unless something worse happens to you. So there's always that a place of love. And to me, that's, that's that place of comfort. Like, don't go that way because it will bring destruction to you. So if, if you go after this place of love, if you go after the, to the wholeness that I've already given to you and you continue to grab a hold of me and, and pursue me and love me with all that you are, oh, I'll tell you what. It's amazing what will happen. And that's what God is doing in this generation. That's what he's doing is he wants us to be prophetic because even prophecy in its purest sense actually means to, to speak words on behalf of God to men. And over 300 times, the, the, the word uh, prophecy is used even in the Old Testament scriptures, and it, and it comes from a Hebrew word, nabi, N-A-B-I, nabe. It means to literally bubble up, to spring forth. And see, that's part of it, is that it's the word of God in the inside of you that, that God wants it to spring up, to spring forth, so that it can water the world around us with words of kindness, words of strength, words of freedom, re- words of joy that literally bring uh, chains and walls down on a generation. And this idea that it also means to, to foretell the future, like literally see into the future. And that's part of what God is raising up. He's, he's, he's raising up real prophetic people. He's raising up prophets. He's raising up sons and da- daughters that will prophesy. So there's, there's, there's the foretelling where you, where you literally see something in the future and you begin to call it forth. Now, I, don't get all political on me. I'm, I'm going to sh- just share some examples. I mean, about a year and a half before Donald Trump was ever president, God said, I'm going to play my trump card, and Donald Trump will be your next president. Now, I'm even in a company of some really high-profile prophetic people in this roundtable that I'm at, and I begin to share this, and they're all like, holy crap, let's stone him. Yeah. I'm just saying. And, and so I just begin to prophesy into that. And again, I'm not a political thing, by the way. So don't, so don't even go there because the moment you come under a political spirit, you've lost your authority. See, because Daniel and Joseph and David didn't come under the political spirit, and that's why they had authority. See, Daniel was an amazing prophet that was alongside four different kings, and he had this place because he worshiped God first and foremost. It's not that he didn't respect the guy that he was working for. I'm not saying that. You don't dishonor and disrespect. Actually, what it says in Timothy, we're actually called to pray for our leaders, those that God has put in authority. Just the same. And so, so in that place, the moment we, we, we come under that, that political spirit, guess what? You, you lose your authority to actually be a voice. So when people ask me, so are you a Republican or Democrat? I said, I'm neither. I'm of the kingdom. And God's given me keys to the kingdom, so that regardless of I'm called to go speak to Democrats or I'm called to go speak to Republicans or even those that are right in the middle, guess what? I've got authority because I'm not under their spirit. I'm empowered by Holy Spirit. And see, that's what God wants us to do. And so I began to prophesy, and guess what? Trump gets elected. Well, there you have it. Whether you agree with it or not, he's elected. He's our president. So pray for him. That's actually what you're called to do, not be critical. See, because our words have power. And the moment we speak, guess what? We've, just, we've literally just energized the spirit realm. And you either are activating demons or you're activating angels. There's nothing in between. Our words activate heavenly realms. 
That's the power we have. We were created in God's image. And when God spoke, light be, guess what? There was light. And it hasn't stopped. That word hasn't stopped. That word has not stopped. That word has not stopped. That word is still producing. That word is still moving. It's still going about. It's still producing, creating light, producing light. And guess what? You're the light because Jesus said, I'm the light of the world. And guess what? I'm going to leave and now you're going to be the light of the world. And guess what? That's the light that God's calling. That's the light that God's putting inside you. One day I was, I was just praying, and, and part of it, just I'm in the presence of the Lord, and I'm listening, and all of a sudden I see this just, just demonic thing just begin to rise up out of the city of Paris. And it was so evil and so demonic. I mean, it was like coming up from the ground, and it began to have, grab grips, and it had like, these tentacles, and it was pulling on Paris. And, and I just sensed that, that there, there, was a, there was a dimension of terrorism that was going to be released. There was this, there's this demonic spirit that was stirring in the atmosphere. And I'm like, whoa, what do you do with that? You know what I mean? So I just began to pray. I said, God, well, don't let it be. And so then I, I, I called a, you know, a bunch of our, we've got a bunch of prophetic people, Cindy Jacobs and James Gall and Patricia King and others, and I just began to submit this word to them. I said, I mean, this is literally a vision I had this morning, and I, I'm somewhat concerned. But can, we, can we put out a 911 and just get people praying? See, because God didn't show me that because that was what was going to happen. I believe God showed me that through our intercession, we could literally change the outcome of what's happening. Look at Amos chapter 7. I mean, there's, there's three different times that God said, I'm going to do this. And Amos says, no, 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 no. And he literally changed God's mind. And part of it, there's, a, there's an intercession that each one of us can t- go into. And then as, as we begin to pray around this, and it was several months. It was probably about four months, five months from when I had the vision until that, that January. And then again, when all of a sudden there was terrorism and crazy attacks that happened in Paris. But I believe that through our prayers and through our intercession, because we've been given a glimpse of what was coming, is that we literally saved thousands of people from perishing. That's the power of it. And so too often is we can, we can get stuck in this realm going, oh, that's what God's going to do. That's too bad, bummer. Rather than, you know what, I'm going to shift this thing. And I've got the power through the Christ inside me, the hope of glory, that, that with my words I can begin to decree, I can begin to declare, and you can begin to decree, and you can begin to declare that even when you see what's going on on the outside, look into the spirit realm and see what God's doing in the realm of the spirit behind the scenes. Because God wants us to shift and change a generation with our words. The devil's scared. No, he really is. He's afraid. I mean, why do you think abortion became legal in 1973? Just saying. Trying to abolish a generation from their destiny because, see, he knows just like he did in the day of Moses. An entire generation was wiped out just like he did in the day of Jesus. He wiped out an entire community of of young boys. He did the same thing right now because he knows that this is the generation that is going to literally shake and shift and shape the reality of what God is doing in the earth. We are in the last days. And we're going to prophesy, and we're going to decree, and we're going to declare, and we're going to become a community that sees how the Father sees, not what the devil's doing. Well, he'll show us what the devil's doing, but it's not to say, oh, that's too bad. Darn, devil. No, actually, we get up and we go, as we're seated with him, as it says in Ephesians chapter 2, that we're seated with Christ in heavenly places. Then all of a sudden, we assume that position as royal sons and daughters. And we begin to now see from the Father's vantage point, and we begin to now speak and prophesy and decree and declare from that place. That's when it all changes. Because we see from a whole different vantage point. And that's why God is inviting us to the higher place. That's why he's inviting us even as a company of people to the higher place. And many of you are going to start dreaming dreams in a fresh way. Many of you are going to, the visions are going to become common. That, that's what God's doing. He's awakening something inside of us. And that's, that's been my hope and my prayer that even as we, we kind of begin to give, give these little morsels and these little keys so that your destiny can be unlocked so that you can be all that God's created you to be. Because you're called to prophesy. You're called to speak into things that you see and shift it if God asks you to. Because we have an amazing future. We have an amazing hope. 
that's been set before us. And that's really God's heart's desire, is that he wants us to, to speak into those realms. He wants us to speak into those places. 